We're interrupting this program in order to begin our regularly scheduled broadcast. Thanks for watching the Lit TV Network. Hey, 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 welcome to Kim's Universe. I'm so happy to be back. I have to say, gosh, prayer changes things. We have walked through some seasons, but um, welcome back to you all viewing and welcome back to me. I want to introduce my, um, I'm, I'm about to call in my co-hosts and that's what they are. I thank them for my for support. Alana Wynn and Twyla Perendo, come on on and introduce yourselves one by one. Lovely beauties. Thank you, Jesus. Well, hello, hello. Good afternoon. I am Twyla Prendo. I am the founder of Cash Kids, where we teach K through 12 students to master money skills early so they can lead a struggle free life. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Hello. When I immediately. Okay, so um, I want to start off with, I would say, look at my face. The theme, first of all, we began to discuss slavery in the United States about eight to nine weeks ago, maybe three months ago, actually, the beginning of the summer. Um, I had to take some time off because of my own need to do self-care. So we're back, but in the climate of that discussion, what we found is that there's a discussion that had been going around concerning slavery benefiting um, African-Americans or Africans, right? And the thing that strikes out to me is, is that first of all, when we first started discussing this information, slavery in the United States. I have my paperwork. I sent it on point, um, I feel like, because um, here it is that this information came up and it hit Florida. And all of us have um, longevity in Florida, the three of us. Um, however, I asked my co host, the two of them, to go back to education. Um, education disadvantages so that we can actually look at the opportunities and educate the parents, our communities on what we need to do to overcome the hurdles of individuals first thinking that slavery was a benefit. Um, I could go to, let me go to my notes before we start ladies. I want to um, read something because I didn't, um, I didn't um, copy it. And um, I went to statistics on slavery because I do like to research. And um, this uh, book came up, it was by an author called Eric Williams. And I just want to read a couple of um, just two paragraphs. It said, few works of history have exerted as powerful an influence as a book published in 1944 called Capitalism and Slavery. Its authors or author Eric Williams, later the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, charged that Black history was the engine that, or black slavery, I'm sorry, was the engine that propelled Europe's rise to global economic dominance. He maintained that Europeans' conquest and settlement of the new world, keep that, that word, those two words, new world, because it's going around right now, depended on the um, enslavement of millions of black slaves who helped to amass the capital that financed the industrial revolution. The Industrial Revolution, just speeding ahead, we can read about was in the 1930s, 40s, around in that time. You can look that up. Um, Europe's economic progress, he insisted, came at the expense of black slaves whose labor built the foundations of modern capitalism. In addition, 
Williams contended that it was economic self-interest and not moral convictions that ultimately led to um, the abolish, abolition of um, slavery. It was only after slavery came to be regarded as an impediment to industrial progress that abolitionists in Europe and the United States succeeded in suppressing the slave trade and abolishing slavery. So I have the link. If anyone wants it, um, you can email me at kim at kimwarnersworld.com or you can go and look up the author. Um, the, the information I gave is on Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery. Okay, so that's to the audience. Um, the reason why I, I, I brought that in is because someone else had motives to make the changes predicated on what they desired. If we take away the idea of um, the benefits that they speak on uh, and also a curriculum being built to teach the children a benefit in education, then I bring in um, Twyla Prindle and ask her because she teaches economics and I'm gonna put it in that um, category because I always push her to excel. Um, it's not just that she teach writing books, but she has the fundamental understanding of numbers. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give this to you now, and we can go in. If you want to start, um, you got your books. I want them to see them because one of the issues that we've discussed is what concerning reading and writing. Go, you go forward. I mean, like which parts you want me to elaborate on? Because it's so much. I mean, we can do a whole a whole series, a, a whole season on education. We we want that. And um, Alana, if you have anything that you want to add um, on the numbers, then just chime right in because we want to educate um, the population on the, the fact that we didn't have the advantage of studying back in um, historical times. Yeah, now we I have the advantage. Go ahead. Yeah, we do. I mean, I think a lot of times when, although things were a certain way back then, um, when you forward to the present, a lot of times, not even just way back then, but we have a tendency to take things for granted. You know, we take education for granted. Um, it also depends on your surroundings, your upbringing, um, how important is education to you. Then I know we previously talked about social media and its play on um, economics. So as far as well, grabbing kids' attention, you know, you see these influencers and they're making hundreds of thousand dollars or whatever they're making. That's more appealing to a kid. They don't see all the work that goes into it. It just seems like easy money. But um, no matter what money you're making, you still have to have some kind of economic sense, right? So when you are taught or was really not taught in school economics or financial literacy a lot of us graduate from school and we don't know exactly how to manage our money so what i focus on is teaching kids early um we all know that well some of us know that kids pretty much they have their mind set on how they're going to handle their money by age 11. that is why it's so important for you to teach kids early um, I know you wanted me to show books, so I've written many bu books. I have a few here, and everything I do, I try to tie it into um, the curriculum and making sure that kids are getting what they need. So even when we talk about reading, yes, I'm doing financial lit literacy, but I try to incorporate reading, writing, and math all together in one. So this one is appropriate for the season coming up, saving money for Christmas. And I know that people will say, oh, yeah, OK, so this is a Christmas book. It's really not a Christmas book because in this book, the kids are learning how to save money for Christmas. And when we talk about our community or just things at hand, it's just that, you know, we think there's a certain season for things. And so what? 
you know, November, December time frame, that's when we're shopping. But when actuality, you know, these things have been planned, should have been planned year round. You know, there's a time where I don't have as many people to shop for now, but most of the time I will be done with my Christmas shopping by March. That's just me, you know, not saying other people should be that way. But that's one. Then I have one. Um, this is a coloring book. So I have two coloring books and I don't have the other one with me, but this is Exploring the World of Investing. So just, you know, kids are not too young. A lot of times we think that when I go and present financial literacy, they say, okay, well, this is for high school students. No, we have to start when the kids are young, kindergarten. That's when we need to start. Because I guarantee you, if I hold a dollar up in front of a two-year-old, they will grab it and they know what it's for. This is another one I have. Why did I get this credit card? Teaching kids about credit, teaching them about debt. Um, this is a very- Raise it up again. Okay. Why did I get this credit card? I have another one called. I love debt the faces. Diaries. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Another one I have called Debt Diaries. It's more on. It's an anthology, actually. So again, that's another way why I incorporate writing into um, the curriculum that I have because the Debt Diaries is there are stories written by kids that their main character had to get in some form of debt, but then they had to get out and learn lessons from it. So that's one. This is the very first children's book I wrote. Can I have some money, please? Of course, you know, all my books are about money. And then we have this one, which is the most popular. Um, where is my money? It's all about a little girl who can't find her money. And then she has a temper tantrum when her parents remind her that, hey, you spend all your toys and money on uh toys and all your money on toys and candy and this is the latest one it is coming out um soon came up with doing some little extra surprises with this one incorporating some um ar and vr technology in this book so this will be a good one what would you do with a hundred dollars so it's all about two kids who both have a hundred dollars and they're trying to figure out what to do with it one takes a path of savings the other takes a path of investing and it teaches you all the different um, aspects of saving because it's more to saving than just putting it into a, a bank account. It's more to investing than just getting into the stock market. So that's what it's all about. And so that's a little synopsis of the books that I have, or some of them actually. Okay, wonderful. And those books I've invested in greatly for people in the mental health um area because without being able to add read and write it's going to cause mental health conditions on the level of self-esteem and confidence and uh, my grandchildren have had them so alana um okay first of all i'm gonna say this is a curriculum to me whereas cash kids has provided this um type of um information and after school programs for how many it's over a decade how many years depends on where how you look at it because of course you know everything i always say it's a marathon and not a sprint because when i first started you know it was a summer camp then it just kind of grew as time went on but from the time that i actually like incorporated we're talking about since what 2005 ish so we're looking okay. at almost 20 years, yeah. Yeah, okay, so Alana, my question to you, when we look at what um, Cash Kids has provided to um, actually the world, we can see a viable curriculum, right? Can you elaborate on that and the power that it would bring to our children if, the parents and communities all over the world actually understood because it's sitting right there in Jacksonville. Um, I thought it was really uh, interesting when thinking about how I think in school when we learn about slavery or maybe I'm just I can only speak for myself. I feel like there's this kind of romanticized version of how slavery ended where folks, you know, the powers that be, if you will, were thinking of the best interest of Black people, you know, and the fact that, you know, they they wanted um, the, that social rights and human rights right at the forefront of their 
mind when they ended slavery. But, you know, based on what we know in the research that Ms. Kim did, that's not necessarily the case. The industrialized industry or the industrial industry rather was at the forefront of their mind. And it was better for them to invest in that aspect um, as opposed to relying on the manpower of slavery. So I think that's an important um, I think that's something very important to keep in mind because keeping that in mind, we can move forward knowing that empowering Black people wasn't exactly the goal. And, okay. you know what I mean? And so that's important too because when we think about desegregation and schools, we can almost take that same concept and apply that in those situations as well. And so the books that Twyla has written is deprogramming some of that, those falsities, that false narrative that was instilled in us, um, which is very important. And I think very. it's also filling in the gaps of education that was during the integration period. Because again, if we are, are kind of going with the notion our and black people wasn't necessarily necessarily the goal when abolishing slavery and when integrating the schools, then we were being programmed at a disadvantage. Our people from the very beginning. And right. so right now with Twyla's books and a lot of black people within the community who are really trying to empower and instill um, a lot of those foundation tools that we weren't given from the very beginning. I think, again, it's about us now reprogramming ourselves, but we also have to be kind of receptive to that and understanding that. And not everybody understands the complexity and how far back that it goes. Exactly. Okay, so um, I love the powers that be. I love that you brought up the powers that be because a lot of times in my classes, I pull out this information in the context of getting back to our individuality. And the reason why we are disadvantaged, number one, is because we don't understand that knowledge is an advancement. We didn't have the opportunity back in history because we were only taught if that the Bible, um, and I'm not putting it down, but we're going to keep it real. We were only taught with the powers that would be wanted us to be taught. So that means that someone's making a decision for us. I, I have a problem with staying in the mind of someone making a decision for us. If anyone goes to my Facebook page, when you see this air, you're going to find um, that I had been posting on individuality because in order to know yourself, you must become an individual for you first. You can't continue to be herded in the masses, or if you continue to be herded, H E R D, then that means that we have the powers that would be controlling us, and someone like Twyla Prendo is writing information to teach our children why because generations would halt and stop having the knowledge of not saving, but being capitalistic, being used, and their money is going to a system. They will learn how to put their money into a system as her information, her books, all the anthologies that she's written, because books, they only point to knowledge. They point to information that can be um, something that's going to change your life. Number one, because it's teaching our generations how to become prosperous and be in good health. That's what the Bible says. Prosperity. God gives you the power to obtain wealth. Whenever someone comes out the gate and they can teach, yes, it is different. They can teach you how to individually learn how to manage money. And we are a culture. Others have tribes. We had to come back into our tribes. And maybe that's why they're my co-hosts, because they keep me grounded. But the fact of the matter that you see someone that has written programs 
and curriculums. That's what it is because it's teaching is in the after school programs and other programs at this time that can deprogram us from just giving our energy to them going to work, these people, the powers that be, and teaching our children. I say us because I told her she, she, she should teach adults. However, moving forward, you understand? Back to you all. Because here, let me, let's go to um, teachers in the classroom size. Do you want to go there or where you want to look at? The testing and curriculum. Of course, you know, the notes. We I got some questions. I mean, I just think it just depends. I mean, if you want to talk about the classroom size, um, at least here, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's one teacher to every 22 kids. Um, I think, like, in the, some of the conversations that I've had with some parents, and again, you know, I don't like to wholly knock the parents because you're a product of your environment. You know, everybody's brought up differently, and we can say that, okay, well, you should do this, but if, if you haven't been around that or raised around that, you are a product of your environment. And I think, like, as I talk to parents sometimes, I'm surprised that, you know, there are many parents who feel like um, what their child knows or does not know is entirely up to the teacher. And my response is always to that, well, okay, first, how many kids do you have? All right, it might be two or three kids. Okay, can you handle your two or three kids at all times? No, no one can. But you expect this teacher to handle 22 some odd kids. It could be 15, I don't care if it's 10, that's still a lot. You expect this teacher to handle all these kids, all these different personalities, different upbringings, different levels, and actually be able to teach wholeheartedly on top of all the other crap for what I'm, for lack of a better word, that they have to deal with that's coming, especially from our state in Florida. So I think, you know, the class size is 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 a is a conversation, but a different conversation to what you know actually is going on. You know, when you think about teacher shortages, you know, are there enough teachers? Oh, sure, there's plenty of teachers out there. It's just a matter of, you know, do you want to teach? Um, and when I say do you want to teach, it's not because you can't like. It, and I'm speaking just for Florida, what I see when I'm in the school. You can't teach like you're used to it. For somebody to come in and, and have a heart to say, I want to teach the kids, I want to do X, Y, Z. It, it's just not so cut and dry like that. And then in Florida here, you know, you start talking about slavery or, you know, some other stuff. You can go to jail now. You might get some jail time. You might get fined. You're already not paying the teachers enough. So on top of that, let's say for me, if I even wanted to teach, I just wouldn't do it. It's too much liability. It's, you know, the kids off the chain. It's just, it's a whole conversation around it. And I don't want to take up the whole time. So, okay. You want to add, Alana, before I go in? Because I, I don't know. I wanted to say. Go ahead. I'll let you finish your thought and I can plug in. The class size. And I advert to the fact that the school system is a part of the system. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, I was, you know, you gave me information that made me think where there's options. We can go into the options next week very much. But my thing is, this is still a part of the capitalistic um, system, which means that the powers that be have created a school system that really is not designed for certain people. And I mean, some of us do make it. I, I want to make it very clear that it's designed by people that really don't have a heart. Because I don't want to go off the um, rails, but I can tell you that everything I teach in mental health, and I say key teach, is supposed to be called therapy. We can call it that. But the therapy is always, you know, what unlocks the mind is taking our people and others, other cultures and tribes, all different nationalities and races that I work with, taking them back to history to show them their identity. Because most people beyond Europeans don't know their identity. 
I mean, would, would y'all shut me down and, and put me off? Because see, it doesn't matter that I tell you that I'm in mental health because I just said earlier in the show that when she's teaching numbers, that is an open door for our people to learn how to manage their money. Me, I'm, I'm teaching people how to manage their emotions, their mindset, so that they can become disciplined. Now, I, I don't think that you can put me and you in the same category as a school system because we have the freedom, so to speak, to be able to teach on our terms. We're not bound by a system and rules. We do have some, you know, but we're not bound by it. You know, like here, a teacher has to stay on path. You know, you have your lesson plans on the board. Right, I get and it. You're not tracking and you're not on target and on time, then, you know, you can get in trouble for that. Versus for me, I can actually go into a classroom and say like my that. goal is to make sure that they learn how to budget. I can stay on budgeting until every child gets it. But it's not like that in the traditional school system. You can stay on, on whatever mental health topic you want till every person gets it. But it's not like that in the school sector. Which I, also, I'm glad that you go ahead. I was going to say, and, and piggybacking off of what Twyla said, I think it also supports the fact that the way the education system is, is designed right now, it's not conducive for many different learning styles. It doesn't take into right. account the different ways children um, obtain information or acquire, acquire it. And I think that's really important because you have different styles just based on how people perceive information and then you have different learning styles based on um, how people grew up and their specific needs. You know what I mean? Like it, it goes pretty deep in terms of what um, a child needs and why and how they um, obtain information. Again, some people, you know, some people learn by doing, by physically moving, by music, by writing or, you know, by listening. Um, so many different things. But the point is, I think I think it's really hard for a teacher to tailor a strict learning system that they're being held to, to all these different learning styles. At the end of the day, the child suffers. I don't fault the teachers, but it really is just um, kind of unfortunate where the education system is at this point, I think. Okay, let me just give one um, little scripture. I want to give this here scripture because i want us to understand the audience not just ourselves um proverbs 2 and 10 it says when wisdom enters thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto then knowledge is pleasant unto the soul so it you know it takes some time for us to understand that knowledge is the way um to gain anything and that's through i i even tell here you know People that I work with, reading is fun for the mental state. Read and read and read. You see the words linguistics is there. Fun for the mental, fundamental. All right. So God bless. We will see you guys next week. Thank you um, for being a part. Bye-bye. Love you all.